I'm Kevin Elmy. In this presentation, we are going to cover cover crop blends, the art in design. One of the toughest steps when we first start getting into cover cropping is to decide to get into cover cropping. Then the, the next intimidating part is going to be what species do we use? What blends? How do we create the blends? Uh, how do we do it? All those, those little details, uh, devil in the, in the details. So the starting point has to be setting goals. Personally, I hate setting goals when we start talking about crop production because mother nature is going to be the one that's going to influence what's, what kind of yields we're going to hit, hit on, on that year. So in this case, when we're setting goals, it's not production wise per se, but it is what do we want to see changes in our soils and what our plants are doing. That is when, th that's the difference in the goal setting in this case. So some examples of, of how to set or what goals to be setting. Do we want to improve the water infiltration rates on that soil? Do we want to suppress weeds? Do we have a certain weed that we want to suppress? Do we want to minimize the erosion? Do we want to improve our soil nutrient availability? Do we want to build that organic matter in our soil? Do we want to reduce the insects or disease? And so when we see the picture on the slide here, you know, we see a little bit of residue, but we don't see a lot of surface soil aggregation. So water infiltration is going to be a problem. There's a lot of bare, bare ground. So we're going to want to suppress those weeds. So there's, there's a few things that you could be just by looking at this picture, what we might be looking at for setting goals. When we start including animals into the picture, you know, that may change some of the goals that we're doing. So, you know, in this case, if we're producing animal feed, are we looking at hanging or silaging it? Or are we going to be grazing it in the field? And are we going to be stockpile grazing it? Are we going to rotational graze it? Or are we looking at using it that as supplemental feed during the growing season? The next thing we need to really look at is our natural resource inventory. So what exactly are we dealing with? So we want to know what our soil texture or soil textures are. Are we dealing with sand? Are we dealing with clay? Are we dealing with, you know, what, what kind of texture we're we working with? Uh, is there any uh, salinity in these areas that we have to be concerned or be aware of? Do we have some uh, existing trees, natural grass? Do we have sloughs? Are there other, other natural or introduced features? And what is meant by that is, do we have uh, a, a fence line? Do we have railroad tracks? Do we have a natural waterway? And then we also want to take a look and take inventory of what plants are growing there. And are there plants that we want growing there? Or are these, in quotes, weeds that are growing there that we necessarily don't want to have there? Next step is logistics. So, okay, we have, uh, we have our goals. We decide we're going to be doing this cover crop thing. Now the logistics part is going to really be setting in because we need to know when we're going to be seeding. Are we going to be seeding, you know, in the, into the frost in the very early spring? Are we going to be seeding uh, right before we seed our cash crops? Are we going to be seeding right after the cash crops? Are we going to allow those cash crops to establish and then seed these uh, late spring, early summer? Or are we looking at taking a cut of hay off and then turning around and putting a cover crop then? Or post harvest, when are we planning on seeding? And then the next question is how are we going to be seeding? So if we are going to go through and have a blend and using some uh, some corn, sunflowers, faba beans, that means we have to use a drill to get them into the ground because aerial broadcasting or, or just broadcasting is not going to be a, a good way to, to broadcast those or to seed those unless <laughs> you're seeding to moisture where it's super wet and, and then maybe it might work, but it's going to be high risk. So this is the next thing. So are we broadcasting or are we going to be using a drill? And then what is the, the, the season weather forecast? Is it, are we in a dry spell? So we're going to be in six weeks of, of dry. So this way, if it's going to be dry, no sense broadcasting because it's going to be stranded right on top, unless that's what your goal is. 
uh, in that case, maybe you want to maybe put it in the ground or delay the seating. And this is where, you know, uh, Drew Lerner, uh, we've been uh, subscribing to his weather forecasts and, you know, we look at it as, as a, one of the necessities for, for inputs on our operation. The next thing we want to look at is how are you going to terminate this cover crop blend? Do we want it to, uh, to, to terminate with the first frost? Are you going to terminate with herbicide or tillage, with grazing? Are you going to roll crimp it? Do, you, do we want maybe not to, to die on that first frost? Maybe we want it to be green right up until the snow flies. Maybe we want it to overwinter. So those are the, the, some of the questions that logistics-wise we, we have to have figured out before we, we start trying to, to advise a, a, or pick a, a cover crop blend. So in other words, there's lots of questions. This pre-planning pays. By having a plan in place when, especially the, the first couple of years when this isn't the normal management practice that, that you may be doing, having the plan in place relieves a lot of the anxiety of, oh, oh right, I have to do this. It's already in the, in the cards to say, okay, we're going to be uh, seeding, we're going to do our herbicide application, then we're going to apply it, seeds there, everything is, is ready to go. It's already in your head that you're doing it. One of the quotes that, that Steve Groff says is that you should treat your cover crops like you treat, uh, treat your cash crops. So have them planned, have everything set up, and then this way they're, they're going to be a, a better chance of having success. One of the things we may have to do is be prepared to evaluate in season. If the plan is to go out and broadcast a, a, a an annual clover into a cereal crop, we seed herbicide application, then there's no rain. Now what do we do? Do we put the seed on and hope it rains? Or once again, if we have Drew's, uh, Drew Lerner's forecast, maybe he's, he is calling for rain 10 days out. Okay, maybe we do it. Maybe we don't. Maybe it's going to be a feed situation where we're planning on doing some, some, uh, some silaging, silaging and grazing and it's another dry year, now maybe instead of taking that cut of silage or hay off of that, maybe we just throw the cows out there earlier and, and do a quick graze on it before we, we uh, <laughs> go out and cut it. So this way, you know, once again, evaluate, reevaluating during the season is, is one of the keys. Okay, now we have our plan in place. Now we can start looking at developing a blend. So with these blends, Species selection will be based on what your goals are, what the climate is, what your logistics are, and your crop rotation. In the big picture, one of the goals that should be in our minds, or some of the goals that should be in our minds, is increasing the plant diversity in our rotation, growing on that land throughout our rotation, and have that green plant growing in the vegetative stage in, through, all through that cover crop season. The more diversity we have in the plants, the more diversity we get in the root exudates, which then drives more diversity in our soil microbiology. The more diversity we have in our soil microbiology, the more fun farming is because we have less issues. When I start looking at picking species and putting a blend together, I work on different functional plant groups. So these different functional plant groups come from different families. I use a, a double triangle. There's other systems out there, but basically I look at grasses, legumes, and broadleaves. The broadleaves, by definition, are not grasses or legumes, so it's a fairly diverse group. So I have that other triangle on here that breaks that broadleaf into brassicas, non-brassicas, and forbs. These, this is where we get our diversity from. To add more diversity into the system, now with, for instance, our grasses, we can deal with warm and cool season grasses. We can deal with annuals, biennials, and perennials. All depends on when we're seeding, what our goals are, what we're trying to do. So adding these different layers of these uh, warm and cool season species, annuals, biennials, perennials, 
we're gaining this diversity within these functional plant groups. These different functional plant groups are going to do different things to the soils. They're going to give different outcomes in our by having them in our cover crops. When we are setting up cover crop blends, what we want to do is avoid any future grain contamination. And what I mean by that is if we have uh, a gluten-free farm and we decide we want to put some uh, uh, winter wheat in in one of our cover crop plants to keep something as, as a green vegetative plant through the growing season, there's a good chance that winter wheat may then overwinter and then show up in that oat crop that next year. So that's not a good thing for the gluten-free market. When we look at uh, insect bridges, uh, that's another one we want to avoid. And in this case, if uh, someone has a, a, a crop oscillation between wheat and canola and decide they want to put radishes in there, if they seed the radishes after the canola, the flea beetles are there, they're going to eat the radishes. If they seed it after the wheat, what's going to happen is the flea beetles, they'll, they'll feed on the radishes in the fall. They'll be able to overwinter, and that next year when you seed canola, flea beetles are going to have a heyday because they're already there and they're going to eat your canola. So this is where that disease bridge is. Disease vectors. A thing we, one of the things we want to watch when we're dealing with winter winter cereals in particular is uh, things like wheat stripe mosaic. So if we have wheat in our cover crop blend and then we have seeded winter wheat into that, there is potential for mites to, to transfer this, this uh, virus from that spring wheat into the winter wheat. So this way we want to make sure, once again, add that diversity, not, not uh, double up on it. The other antagonisms, antagonisms that we want to avoid are things like allelopathy. So allelopathy is a chemical that is released from one plant that reduces or eliminates growth of other plants around it. So fall rye is a good, good example of that. With fall rye, the allelopathy, it is in your the root exudates. So once again, people grow fall rye because it is easy, uh, it's, it's winter hardy, and it cleans up the land because it, it kills off and, and suppresses the weeds. Well, when we're seeding cover crops with that, the, rye, the fall rye sees these cover crops as a weed. So through the root exudates of the fall rye, when it's in the vegetative stage, it will prevent or hinder these other plants to establish into it. Then when the, when the fall rye then goes to the reproductive stage, its uh, root exudates dr drop dramatically, and the allelopathy then starts building up in the straw. When that rye is then harvested and that straw is chopped and spread, when that straw is rotting, it then re-releases that allelopathy back into that soil. So then you have those two er two times where you have to worry about that fall rye allelopathy especially with shallow-seeded, small-seeded species. When you start talking about uh, corn, uh, sunflowers, su uh, soybeans, peas, we're seeding deeper, so then the allelopathy is, is less of an issue when we get deeper. So basically what we want to do is manage these cover crops within your actual cropping rotation. One of the really neat ideas and theories out there is, is what they... Uh, Dr. Christine Jones talks about the microbe quorum. Uh, Dr. Uh, Bassler also talks about it in, in, in her presentations. But what they have found is when we have a cover crop and a, a simple cover crop of, of you know, just a, a single species, that's, that'll end up better than, than nothing. But as we start adding more species, more diversity, more functional plant groups into these mixes. And Dr. Jones, she talks about, you know, the magic tipping point is what she's seen is about six different functional plant groups. Once we get there, then all of a sudden that soil really becomes alive. And because we have this diversity in plants and we have these this diversity in, in the, these root exudates, then we start getting this multiplier effect in the soil in these micro populations.
And when we start doing that, these microbes are able to talk to each other and, and you know, cooperate and work together. So this is where these, this, this functional plant groups is, is really, really important. When we start looking at the different functional plant groups, uh, so we'll start with the grasses. The grasses, the, the strengths of them is if you want to produce biomass, grasses do that. It has a, they have a good fibrous root system that helps stabilize the soil. Uh, once again, uh, really get into that soil and, 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 and really anchor it down. Um, lots of root exudates all over the place. Lots of choices in, in the grass family. So we have lots of annuals, uh, biennials, perennials, warm and cool season species that are available all across the, the Western prairies. With grasses, they will accumulate phosphate, and that's important when we start talking about legumes. And most of the, the grasses out there are mycorrhizal friendly. There's a few that, uh, once again, a gradient where things like fall rye are, are, are known as being the least of the mycorrhizal friendly, whereas your warm season species, uh, they a lot of them are, are highly dependent on, on mycorrhizae. The concern with grasses, we need to feed them nitrogen. And the other weakness, if you call it a weakness, is we already have a fair amount of grasses in rotation. Uh, maybe not the diversity, but there's a, in, in a lot of rotations, there's, there is a, a lot of grass in it. Legumes, legumes, the strength is it fixes nitrogen. They're highly mycorrhizal, so if you want to start building mycorrhizae in the soil, legumes are a real good way, minus lupins. Lupins are, are non-mycorrhizal. They produce a very high feed quality. So if we're looking at, you know, the feed aspect, you know, that's that's part of the reason why we want to have them in there. The issue is they do require a lot of phosphate. And the phosphate is required because when the plant is fixing nitrogen, it requires a lot of energy. And phosphate is that energy transfer uh, through the ATP cycle. So it does, does need that phosphate. The root system tends to be fairly weak. It tends to have a bit of a tap root and then, you know, some secondary root system. But the whole idea of, it, of the, the highly mycorrhizal is because it has a, a poor, poor root system than, than what a grass would have. So this way that mycorrhizae then acts as the roots. So this way the the, the legume can, t can concentrate more on the above ground and the, the, the nitrogen fixation. Most of the legumes can be viewed as early successional plants, which means that most of them in a, in a mix, if we're looking at a perennial, they start dying out relatively, relatively quickly. So that, that can be viewed as a, a bit of a concern. The broadleaves, uh, first we'll start with the brassicas. So the, the strength of the brassicas, they are awesome for nutrient scavengers. If you have any free nutrients in the soil, they're going to soak them up and, uh, and tie them up. So that's going to produce a lot of fast growth. The, the tuber plants, they're really good at reallocating those deep nutrients and bring them up to the surface, uh, rot, and then, and then recycle those, those nutrients fairly quick. The biennial, uh, biennial plants, uh, when they, something like the radish, where they, they do not overwinter in a lot of places in Western Canada, they, they will rot very, very quickly in the spring. So that quick rot will then free up those nutrients that it, that it brought up and then re-release it for that next year's growth. The concerns, especially with the brassicas, there's lots of canola in the area, so it, we don't need that to add diversity. We do have that disease and bug issue uh, when we have these brassicas in. So, you know, the rhizoctonias, the pythiums, uh, of all of those those root, dise root diseases are a concern. Flea beetles are a problem. The, when we start looking at the hay content or hay, hay production, uh, the high moisture content, they, they are very slow to dry down. So they can be a bit of a, an issue when we start looking at, at trying to hay. And even if we deal with silage, if we're looking at, uh, at, at doing silage and we're dealing with a plant that's 80% moisture and we're cutting it late in the fall, drying is going to be a bit of an issue. When we have this feed and we're feeding something with a high brassica blend, 
in a lot of cases, the relative feed value can be over 200. So 250, 275. When you look at a beef animal, even a, a dairy, that's too rich for them. And then when we start talking about, uh, you know, 35% uh, protein, that gets into the bloodstream of the animal when it consumes it. And the kidneys then have to take that excess nitrate out of the blood. And that's, once again, a lot of energy uh, taken out of that animal. The last thing that uh, I see as a negative for the brassicas is these things will drive your bacteria populations because you're dealing with a fairly tight carbon to nitrogen ratio. And that means they rot quickly. When it rots quick, quickly, that means you're building up your, your bacteria populations in those soils. When we start looking at the non-brassicas, uh, the strength, number one, is it's going to add diversity to our system. The other one that I like about having these non-brassicas is it's able to cycle nutrients at different depths. So you look at sunflowers, great taproot, uh, gets down there, highly mycorrhizal, uh, brings up those nutrients, and, and because that stalk doesn't rot real quick, well, this is when it does start rotting during that next year, it will then be able to feed that crop later into that, that next year. The concerns with it is when we start looking at, once again, sunflowers, even buckwheat, it's a bigger seed, so we just can't broadcast them on. So that we're going to have to definitely put those into the ground to get them to grow under a lot of the, the a lot of situations. Forbes. Forbes are one of the species that, once again, Christine Jones, when, when I listened to one of her presentations in Brandon, she said that the average pasture in the world is 60% 60, 60 forb and 40% grass. And it kind of messed with my head because I I'd never thought of that. And so when we look at our cropping systems, we have uh, our cash cropping, we don't have them. Even in our pastures and, and, and hay fields, we don't utilize a lot of forbs in our soils. So to have a little bit of forb on in our mixtures really does a, a re some real nice things to our soils. So it really adds a lot of diversity. And a lot of them, because they're forbs, they tend to be low growing, they will tolerate a fair amount of competition. So they will, uh, they'll, they'll survive under a fairly heavy stand, but not necessarily uh, take over and, and, and smother. The issue with the forbs, not a lot of selection for, for the cap cash cropping situations. And it, the, there's going to be a bit of uh, a sticker shock when, when we see the price. They tend to be high price per pound, but the species that we've been utilizing so far are extremely small seeded. So instead of looking at, you know, pounds per acre, we're talking about fractions of a pound. So a quarter pound will, for a lot of these uh, forbs will, will do enough to, to justify their, their inclusion. So when we look at these blends, so species selection will be directed by what our goals are. What are we trying to do? Seeding date. When are we seeding it? Seeding method. How are we seeding it? The weather and climate trends. What is the soil moisture like and what it, will it be like in the next few weeks? And by our rotation. What have we grown? What are we going to grow? So we're going to go through some different scenarios and, and do some examples. So in this scenario, we have a 100-acre field. It's a loam texture. The moisture is good, and we're planning on doing a full-season cover crop. We're going to be seeding late spring. We're going to get our cash crops in and then seed this after we're done that. And our goal is to get a cut of hay, and then we're going to graze the field. Our issues in the field, we have some salinity. We have low water infiltration, and we want to terminate it by winter. So in this case, what I have put together is some Japanese millet, some Italian ryegrass, some Persian clover, crimson clover, some collards, some fodder beets, some sunflowers, and some phacelia. So on the left in the purple, you'll see the number of pounds per acre. On there, uh, so that will then influence in the spreadsheet that I've created on on the, the, the about the middle, 
where it said so the, the, the seeds per, per square foot. That will then tell us how many seeds of each one of those species, assuming that this is an average lot, an average seed size, how many seeds of each one of those are going to be seeded. So on the bottom of that column is the number of seeds per, per acre that we're, we're planning on seeding play around with it and and so if it's going to be you know whatever your goals are but you know these are kind of the densities that I like to see uh, if in in most cases dry land in western Canada uh, we're going to be looking for, for at cereals somewhere between 25 and 32 seeds per square foot when we start looking at wetter areas or irrigation being up into that 40 range isn't un, isn't uncommon so there's a scenario there, the way I have this spreadsheet set up is, uh, so we have our seeds per square foot, we have our percent of pure stand, we have the, the um, a percent of plants in that stand, so that this way we can say that, okay, this is going to be, it looks like it's going to be dominated by grasses or it's going to be dominated by broadleaf or we have an idea of, of what that stand will look like. Uh, then we we have the, the prices in here from, from the year 2020 from Imperial Seeds. Then we have figured out the cost per uh, dollars per acre for each one of those ingredients. And then the column after that is what group is that from? So in this case, the Japanese millet is a WSG, so warm season grass. And in this case, it's an annual. So there's, there's an example. Uh, the the price and prices in the bottom right hand corner if you want to see the the totals so in this case here's our our working triangles so in the grasses we have um well i forgot the italian ryegrass uh the the japanese millet and your italian ryegrass are both grasses we have a warm season grass an annual we have a cool season biennial with italian ryegrass the Persian clover, cool season annual. The Pers uh, crimson clover is a cool season annual. Your beets are a cool season annual. Sunflowers are warm season annual. Phacelia is a forb, so it's cool season annual. And your collards are a cool season, it should be a biennial. So we're covering off a lot of the boxes in that blend. In scenario number two, Still at 100 acres. Now we're dealing with a loam, uh, good moisture. So that's the same. Full season cover crop, see the late late spring cut of hay and then fall and spring grazing issues some salinity we have some water infiltration issues but we want to terminate that in in the spring before we go out and harvest so we can use the same scenarios uh, the, you know a lot of the the same same thought process but now we're going to want to use grasses that will overwinter so in this case, um, so the, once again, this spreadsheet, I have the top part of, of what, what is going to be supplied in this case by Imperial Seeds. And then on the, on the bottom, there's the, the oats, winter triticale on the bottom, and that's going to be the, the farmer supplied seed. In this case, what we're going to do now is because we want this stuff to overwinter, so we're going to have, uh, you know, having festiolium. So festiolium is a, a short-term or short perennial grass. So we'll put some of that in. Uh, so we'll take out the, the Japanese millet and replace it with that. We'll still use some oats, but in this case, we're going to use winter triticale as, as our third grass. When we look at the legume component, we're going to use some sweet clover and we're going to use hairy vetch. Both of those will overwinter. The non-brassicas don't have any in... in in this blend this at this time, but as a four, we're gonna throw in some chicory. As a brassica, we're gonna use some turnip rape, we're gonna use some turnips. So now we have a, a tuber crop in there. Once again, we're adding diversity, but because our goals have changed, now we're using different species. We want enough of these plants that are gonna overwinter that will then produce us grazing for next spring. So there's the we don't have as many check check boxes uh, in this case. And once again, if we wanted to have that non brassica, we could throw a little bit of sunflowers in. That's not the end of the world. Scenario three, 100 acres of oats. And this is in a, a cash crop situation. 
Uh, it's going to be in loam, good moisture. So this is going to be a relay cover crop. And the relay cover crop is we're going to have our cash crop and we're going to introduce another crop so that when we harvest that, that cash crop, that relay cover crop is going to be already growing underneath that cash crop and continue growing after harvest right up until freeze up or whatever our goals are. So we're going to seed the Italian ryegrass in uh, Italian ryegrass and the subterranean clover in with the oats at the same time. And our goal is to fix nitrogen and suppress weeds because our issues are a late weed flush and we have low, low nitrogen in the ground and we want this to terminate at freeze up. So in this case, we're going to seed our oats and we're going to cut our seeding rate on our oats back about 10% of what we normally see. And we're going to add the Italian ryegrass, which once again is a cool season biennial, and that subterranean clover. Having having that, that uh, Italian ryegrass in, because it's going to stay in the vegetative stage, it's going to soak up any free nitrates that show up in that, that soil. It's going to then build it, its internal protein up so high and it's going to say well i don't need any more nitrogen because nitrate is passively taken up by the plant in the water it will then re-release that nitrogen in a different form other than nitrate back into the soil so it'll be released as protein amino acids uh, oils things like that as root exudate from that italian ryegrass so it's going to keep that nitrate away from the weeds and that will help suppress those weeds and then the clover is going to be there fixing nitrogen, building mycorrhizae, uh, real nice system. So once again, we don't have as many uh, check marks on this one, but once again, depending on what we've done in the rest of the rotation, maybe we don't need as much diversity in this, this crop in this year. So in this case, once again, we're dealing with oats. We're still going to be looking at a relay cover crop, but now instead of being loam with good growing conditions, or good soil moisture now we're dealing with sandy loam and we're dealing with dry soil moisture so we're going to be seeding at the same time we're going to be still wanting to fix in we're still want to suppress weeds we have this late so we're dealing with the same scenario on the on the left hand side except now we've made it dry so now we we've moved uh, south of moose jaw on on a on a dry year now how do we manage it well normally when we look at our, our oat seeding density in as compared to being in Melfort, in Melfort, okay, we can crank up the seeding rate and, and you know, it's going to work fine. When we start getting south and drier, now we're going to be cutting back our seeding rate of our cash crop. And we can also cut back a little bit on our density on our cover crop, making it all work for, for the, the sake of, of, of keeping the economics in line. So when we start talking about cover crop lens, in, uh, in all the years that I've been working with cover crops, I've not seen a wrong blend, but I've seen some blends that have pigeonholed uh, producers where they're using species that for the, for the wrong purpose, at the wrong time, wrong logistics. You know, there, there could have been better, better picks. And this is where in these blends, I've never, I've never seen a blend where I couldn't have altered it, whether it's, uh, you know, different diversity, uh, changing the seed or the plant density. So once again, you know, just increasing rates of something or putting down the timing, timing of the seeding, timing of termination, uh, just once again, just tweaking some of the goals. And once again, maybe you're doing this because the, these species, this blend is matching what you want to do. Perfect. Uh, doing something is better than doing nothing. You just have to remember that diversity is more important than density of each species. So having more species to a point is better than, than having it a little too simple. We have to, when we start talking about having, you know, 25 species in a blend, we have to think if we're adding uh, a, a cover crop and it's going to be a, a, a grazing blend and we're going to be aiming at 30 seeds per square foot and we have 30 different species, what's the chances of having each one of those species represented in that square foot? slim to none we're going to have some overlap so this is where we have to make really pay attention to you know keeping it relatively simple but using those functional plant groups so that when we're talking about diversity and say yeah we have diversity because we have oats barley and wheat in this mix those are all the same functional group 
So it really doesn't add much for diversity from the standpoint of the microbes. It may extend the, the, the window that you can cut and harvest, but it doesn't do much for the soil. When we're dealing with the soil and the soil moisture, that, that square meter of, of soil will only support so many plants per square foot. When we start putting down 60 seeds per square foot in a dry area like Oyen on a normal year, 60 seeds per square foot, the, the soil cannot support that. What we can do is in these diverse blends is we can take what the normal plant density is and add 20%. And using that that rule of thumb, that will allow the soil will be able to, to, to function properly and support that type of population. On the flip side, you get too low, we're going to have bare soil and then we're going to have other issues. When we look at using a relay cover crop, and that's where you grow the cash crop, you introduce a second one, second crop or cover crop into it so that it continues to grow after you do your harvest, you may have to reduce your seeding rate of your cash crop slightly to allow some sunlight in to allow that cover crop. And, you know, once again, uh, species uh, selection is going to be fairly important, but allow that, that relay cover crop to survive underneath instead of getting choked out because it doesn't get any sunlight. So that's the other other thing you just have to watch. But when we start looking at the diversity, you know, we're looking above ground, we're thinking below ground, we're thinking about when it's growing, how it's growing, uh, the, you know, you can't get into the root exudate uh, thought process. But, you know, this is the, the jungle that we, we want to progress toward when we start talking about regenerative agriculture. When we talk about uh, conventional, uh, this looks like a mess. But when we start talking about getting this diversity and, and building soil, this is how our soils were built with diversity. So, you know, get a, 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 a some of these pictures of these roots or get a backhoe and dig a hole to see what these roots are doing. We need to be able to think about when we're picking these species, what are these root systems like? Are we dealing with a fibrous root or a tap root? Are we dealing with a shallow root system or are we dealing with a root that's going to drill down two meters? Are we looking at something that's going to have quick early growth or are we dealing with something that really isn't going to start growing until when, when the soils really start warming up? Those are the things we have to think about. When we think about the, the plant tolerances, you know, what happens if it's cold year? How many of those plants are going to be happy and continue growing? On the flip side, when it gets hot, how many of those plants are going to continue growing? Because if we have these plants that die or go dormant, that doesn't help us all much except for it increases our, our uh, soil armor, which still is a, a good thing. Dry versus wet. Do we have something in there for some, some built-in drought resistance? When we have a plant that's mycorrhizal and has a deep root system, that mycorrhizae will actually transfer water from that deep tap root to the shallow rooted species. So it will function to keep that system going because with the mycorrhizae, it's symbiotic. So we ne it needs to have living hosts to be able to survive. And we want to add that one plant or two plants, whatever we want, but we need to have a plant that stays in the vegetative stage of its life through that whole growing season. This way, when that plant is in the vegetative stage, it releases up to 80% of the, the carbon it captures through photosynthesis into the soil as root exudates. When it goes to the reproductive stage, it then needs that all that carbon to produce that grain and that biomass. So having that plant in, in the vegetative stage is going to feed that soil for a longer period of time. Uh, if you go to the Cotswold Seeds uh, website, they have a beautiful uh, a PDF that you can download. I need a little bit of, uh, of a, a translation because when we have to remember the Cotswold Seeds is from, from England. So uh, Lucerne is, is uh is alfalfa and coxfoot is uh, is orchard grass. So, but you get to take a look at, you know, just a, a rendition of what these roots are doing, what the above ground is doing, and then what it's doing for that soil. So blends, 
take a look at your rotation. How can you add diversity to that system? Both in that functional plant groups, including warm and cool seasons plants, because each one of those those groups, the warm season, cool season, they release root exudates into the soil differently. So that's going to add more diversity into the soil. Adding that annual, biennial, and a perennial into your system. It, it's crucial because it's just going to keep changing up uh, these and, and adding to this diversity you have in the soil. And having those diverse root types, very important. Having an active growing root is crucial for the development of mycorrhizae in our soil. We need to have that root continuing to grow. And we want to have that plant growing in the vegetative stage. So in summary, you know, it, this, is, this is another tool to, to make our soils healthier, to reduce our cost overall. And when we start looking at traditional ag culture, modern ag culture, there's these problems. And the deeper we get into these problems, the solutions are right there. Uh, when we look at, you know, uh, Canadian thistle, you know, tillage spray, that is just a sign that we have anaerobic soil. So we need to have that more diversity. The soil, these weeds are trying to fix the soil for us. And so these problems that we have, we have to take a step back and, and find out what the actual problem is. And using the cover crops, once again, we can set up a system to fix the, the, the actual symptom or the, the, the problem and not worry about the symptoms. We, when we see the symptoms, what's the cause of those symptoms? Get down to the cause of it and then we can have some solutions. Hope you enjoyed it and uh, happy cover cropping.